Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I am Halil Ibrahim Kalkan, a software architect and developer. I highly contributing to open source projects on GitHub. And I am also a uh, co-founder of Volosoft. At Volosoft, we are also building open source and commercial uh, development tools for developers. One of the most known open source projects of us is ASP.NET Boilerplate. It has been around more than six years and has a good number of stars on GitHub and a good number of downloads on the Get. It uh, tries to fill the gap between plain ASP.NET Core and enterprise-level application scenarios by providing some infrastructure and architecture model. <coughs> so, one of the benefits of this framework also pro it provides an architectural model based on domain-driven design. You, you know, whenever you start a new project, you need to select tools, you need to uh, decide on some uh, coding styles, uh, some best practices, some patterns, or some architecture. So it creates a standard model for developers, and it's being used more, maybe thousands of developers, more than tens of thousands of developers uh, today. Anyone knows ASP.NET Boilerplate here? A few. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can check it. So, in this talk, I will uh, briefly introduce domain driven design, but it will be a short part because the main part is the second part, the implementation. In the first part, I will just introduce the architecture and execution and web uh, request execution flow of a DDD based application. I will introduce building blocks and some common principles. In the second part, I will show a Visual Studio solution, which is layered based on domain-driven design. And then I will introduce some explicit rules and some best practices and examples uh, for a typical domain-driven design-based application. Uh, there is a famous quote from Johan Cruyff. I don't know how it's pronounced. So, playing football is very simple, but playing simple football is the hardest thing there is. So if we want to take this for programming, we may write something like that. Writing code is very simple, but writing simple code is the hardest thing there is. So in this talk, I will introduce some simple rules, actually simple to implement, but when you, your application gets complicated, it will be hard to implement these simple rules. Yeah, I know, but if you try to follow these rules, your application will be more maintainable and easy to react to changes. So first part, what is domain-driven design? The definition is something like that. Domain-driven design is an approach to software development for complex needs by connecting the implementation to an evolving model. It mostly focuses on the core domain logic rather than the infrastructure details. It's suitable for complex domain and large-scale applications rather than simple crude applications. Finally, it helps to build a flexible, modular, and maintainable code base based on the object-oriented pro object programming principles. It actually extends object-oriented programming principles. In domain-driven design, there are typically four layers offered uh, as a best practice. The domain layer implements the application independent core business rules, while application layer implements use case of the system. A use case is typically a user interaction on the user interface. Presentation layer contains user interface elements. And finally, the infrastructure layer supports other layers by implementing some abstractions and integrating to third party libraries and systems. Another representation of the layering is the clean architecture, or sometimes called as onion architecture, where each layer depends on the, exactly uh, the layer inside it. Uh, Domain-driven design mostly focuses on the domain and application layers, and generally ignores the presentation and infrastructure. So in the domain layer, we have entities an entity is a business object which has its own data, state, properties, whatever you want to say, and methods that implement business logic 
running on these properties. Value object is same. The main difference is that a value object is represented by its properties rather than the identity. Sorry. Uh, an aggregate is a cluster of objects bound together by an aggregate root, which is a specific type of entity, but has some additional responsibilities because it's the root entity of the, this uh, aggregate cluster. Repository is a collection-like interface that is used to access to database and make it easier for application and domain layers. Sorry. <laughs> domain service is another type of business object which implements our core domain rules, but in this time it's generally uh, used to create business uh, logic that uses multiple entities or uses some external services. Specification is a name it reusable and combinable uh, business related filter. I will introduce why we need to specification and how it is implemented. In the application layer side, we have application services. An application service is a typically a class that has methods. Each method corresponds to a use case of the system. That's generally the, uh, a user inter interaction, as I said before. It gets and returns data transfer object, not entities. And also, a, a method of an application service is considered as unit of work. That means it should be transactional, atomic, in the other hand. Uh, let's see a sample Visual Studio solution, which is layered based on DDD. Yeah, there may be some alternative scenarios, but this is the uh, best approach I found over the years. I split my domain layer into two Visual Studio project, C Sharp project. The, the uh, domain that shared project is, uh, that contains some constants, some types or primitive types that is shared among all layers of the system. While domain layer implements the actual business logic containing entities, domain services, and repositories. Application layer is also split to two projects the application contracts contains the interfaces of the application service. That makes uh, using the application services without depending the implementation. So it also contains the data transfer objects. The application project implements these interfaces using domain objects. It's typical to create a single infrastructure project, but I prefer to create separated projects per major dependencies, like Entity Framework here. I created an Entity Framework core uh, project to make my solution independent of Entity Framework. So it contains my DB context, <coughs> repository implementations, and uh, object uh, relational mappings. Web layer contains uh, the web stuff, which is ignored. Uh, and the, I generally create a, a test project for each layer. And this is an integration test project and also contains some unit tests inside it for the each layer. Uh, so let's see the dependency chain between projects. The domain shared is used by all uh, projects. So domain uses domain shared because it uses uh, enums and other primitive types inside it. Application contracts also shares uh, the same uh, primitive objects with the domain layer and can use these primitives in the DTOs. Application project depends on application contracts because it implements the interface using the domain objects. So it's also dependent to the domain project. And the framework core or infrastructure layer generally depends on your domain because it uses entities to create data uh, relational object mapping. And web layer depends on the application contracts, not to the application project. So in this way, it safely uses the interfaces without depending on the implementation. Let's see a typical uh, web request execution flow for a domain-driven design implemented application. Everything begins with a user interaction. It's a use case in the system. It's typically a web request which is handled by an MVC controller or Razor page, whatever you, you are using. Uh, the controller can implement some cross-cutting concerns like uh, 
authorization, validation, some kind of exception, handling, audit, logging, or caching. It finally uses the application service interface uh, to delegate work to the application layer. Application layer get DTOs or may return DTOs uh, to the presentation layer. It uses domain objects like entities, uh, value objects, domain services, repositories uh, to implement and to co coordinate the business logic. It also can implement some level of authorization, validation, audit, logging, and so on. And it also implements unit of work to make the use case transactional. So lastly, I will uh, introduce some common principles before going to the implementation. The first rule, your domain-driven design-based application should be database or ORM independent. That means uh, you cannot use DB context uh, objects in your repository interfaces or on your domain uh, layer directly. It should also be presentation technology agnostic. And DDD generally doesn't care about reporting or mess querying. It's another topic. You generally uh, don't implement DDD. You can just write a stored procedure, <laughs> if you like, uh, for mess querying. DDD mostly focuses on the state changes of domain objects, because this is the domain rules. Let's begin to the implementation. My implementation uh, assumes an example scenario where uh, I have implemented GitHub. You probably are using GitHub. So uh, GitHub, we have repositories, issues, labels, and so on. The issue aggregate uh, is a typical issue, which uh, has an aggregate root as an issue entity, which contains text, is closed, or close reason, something like that, and has a reference to comment and issue label entities. Issue label actually is a value object. Uh, it has collections for this uh, internal sub-collections sub and sub-entities. It is a reference to the repository because an issue is related to a repository. And also it is a, a, a reference in the issue label to the issue, uh, to the label aggregate root. And finally, it has a reference to the user aggregate root. This is example domain. So I will, uh, the, the samples will be based on this domain mostly. So let's begin with the common principles of aggregate rules. An aggregate root is saved and retrieved as a single unit, with it is also up collections and all properties. That's, uh, that's simple, but a little uh, unfamiliar to entity framework core developers. For example, if you want to uh, just create a new comment to issue, I should uh, bring the issue aggregate as a wall with all comments and labels and add uh, the new comment to the comments collection of the issue aggregate root. This is needed because uh, we are implementing business roles in the code. I cannot directly insert uh, a new comment to the database using some SQL because it lacks the, uh, it uh, makes impossible to implement business rule in C sharp. An aggregate root or entity should maintain it, it is self integrity and validity by implementing core domain rules and constraints. We implement domain rules as much as possible in entities. It's also uh, for the aggregate root. It's also uh, responsible to manage it is sub-collections, and sub-entities. An aggregate root, or an aggregate, is generally considered as a transaction boundary. That means if you don't even use an explicit transaction, you can safely uh, make multiple uh, chains in an uh, aggregate, then save it as a, transaction, uh, as a single operation with, uh, safely. So you don't need to explicit transaction. You know, some database providers uh, don't provide transaction systems. So uh, working with DDD and aggregates makes it easier to create aggregate-based transactions. 
And finally, an aggregate should be serializable. It's not required for a relational database, you know. You can just reference to other entities and put everything inside it, and you can just arrange it in the mapping site. But for NoSQL databases, it should definitely be serializable because, for example, in MongoDB, it is saved as BSON or JSON object, so it should be serializable and deserializable. Let's begin the first explicit rule. Reference other aggregates only by ID. In the sample, a repo repository aggregate and an issue aggregate, the repository aggregate has a collection of issues, which is another type of aggregate route. So it is not, uh, it's not possible to have this type of collections because it's another type of aggregate route. Also, issue has a uh, repository navigation property, so we also can, cannot define navigation properties to other aggregates. So this pattern is uh, very familiar to Entity Framework core developers but it is not suitable for DDD, and it's not suitable for NoSQL databases, you know. So, whenever we need to reference to a, uh, an object out of our aggregate, we need to use ID. So, uh, when, when we, we are working with an issue aggregate, and we need to, its repository, then we need to query repository separately. One good practice is to keep it simple and small. Let's uh, see this sample. We have a role aggregate route and user aggregate route, which the role has user's collection. It is a collection of user role value object. There is no problem here. It is not referencing to uh, other aggregate route. It's the same for user. It's yeah, just using this value object. Uh, so. In the formal uh, point, there is no problem with this code, but there is a problem of, uh, about uh, performance. Assume that we have a rows collection in the user, and uh, typically a user has a few rows, so uh, if you want to get a user aggregate as a whole unit from database, it will not a problem, but for the role, it will be a problem, because a role may be assigned to thousands or millions of users, and whenever we get a role, we should get the, the complete user list in this case. So it's not practical, it's not performant. So we should consider object user together, but we should also consider the query performance and data integrity. Uh, for the prim primary case part, aggregate route typically has single primary case, and uh, it's generally made as GUID. I prefer GUID, but it's another discussion. Uh, for the entity side, you can define composite prim primary case. That means multiple properties as, uh, as a single uh, primary case. Uh, actually, for NoSQL databases, there is no point, there is no concept of composite primary case like that, because whenever you get an organization from database, the organization user list will be available inside this aggregate. So you don't query uh, the organization user indi individually. But for relational databases, you need the primary case for all tables. So a composite primary case is good for entities inside aggregate routes, inside aggregates. The most important method of an aggregate or entity is the constructor. Actually, it's for all objects in object-oriented programming. The constructor should force to create a valid entity in the beginning of its life. So it should get a minimum required arguments in its, par as, uh, its parameters and checks valid validity of these inputs. In the sample code, it checks if text is null, and it also initializes sub-collections, so it is safe to use the label sub-collection after creating the issue. We generally uh, are creating some private default constructor that is used for ORMs and the serialization purposes. A small tip is, here is, uh, we don't suggest uh, using GUID, that new GUID inside the constructor because it's not 
uh, good with uh, SQL clustered indexes, you know. It's not sequential. So it's better to create a, another service that, is, that creates sequential GUIDs and passes the GUID as a parameter to the entity constructor. So it, it is not responsibility of entity to create a GUID value. So we have created a valid object, but if we have public setters for everything, then it will not continue as a valid object in its life. So uh, an entity should maintain object validity. So we can use private setters when we need. For example, uh, for this uh, example, uh, the text should, be, should not be null, so I made it private and created a set text method which checks if it is null or not. Also, we have properties for changing other properties, like uh, methods for proper changing properties. I have an is closed boolean property and close reason. Whenever I close an issue, I should uh, set a close reason. This is a business rule. So uh, I should ensure that this is this properties changes together. So. I uh, made them private and created the close and reopen methods. Uh, close gets a reason and automatically closes the issue. And reopen makes issue open again and sets close reason to null. So this forces to uh, implement business rules itself. Uh, when we have a problem uh, in the in the entity methods, we can just create some specialized exception class. Like uh, in this sample, we have is closed, is, clo is locked, and closed reason. So lock business is something like that. If you want to uh, uh, lock an issue, it should be cl it should be uh, closed first. If it is not closed, it just throws an exception. So it's uh, the exception is typically handled by the presentation layer and shown a uh, good response to the user or the third-party client. It is the same for close and reopen methods. Reopen methods force that uh, the issue sh should not be locked uh, to make it reopen. So we have three properties and four methods to, uh, make, uh, to ensure that business rules are implemented. Let's see another case. How to implement when you need to an external service. Let's assume we have a business rule that says we cannot assign more than three issues to a user concurrently. Now, I created an assign to method and made the assigned user ID private, so this forces to use assign to method always. It gets a user. Uh, the trick here is I'm getting a user entity rather than a user ID, GUID. A GUID can be anything. It's not a guarantee that it's a user. So a user object is getting a user object is better. So I am also getting an external service that is used to query issue count on a user and throw an exception based on that case. Uh, this forces to implement the business rules, but this implementation as a problem it makes our entity depending on some external services. So uh, there is an alternative scenario to make it a domain service. I will come to domain services later. But let's go with the repositories. As I said before, a repository is a collection-like interface to interact with the database to read and write entities. We define interfaces of repositories inside the domain layer because it's used by domain and application layers but implement it in the infrastructure layer. Repositories shouldn't include domain logic and should be or more database independent. We should create repositories only for aggregate routes, not for all entities, because whenever we need to uh, access to an entity, we should get the wall aggregate and work on this entity. So, we should not directly query or directly get an entity of an aggregate. Uh, let's see a sample uh, repository interface, which as a single method, get inactive issues in the iissue repository. An issue is something like that, is closed, assigned user ID, creation time, and last comment time properties. 
<coughs> the rule says that we should not include business logic into repositories. What is an is inactive issue? Its inactive issue definition is a business rule. Let's see the implementation. <coughs> I implemented it using entity framework, so I injected DB context and so on. Uh, I'm using DB context that issues that were and writing some were condition. And is an inactive issue is defined like that. It should be open. It should not. It should be assigned to nobody. It should be created more than 30 days ago, and it should have the last comment was 30 days ago or no comment. So, if an issue uh, satisfies this condition, it is considered as is inactive. So this, I think that this is an implicit definition of a domain rule. The problem occurs when we want to reuse this domain rule in the another uh, code part of the application. For example, in the issue entity, I want to create an is inactive method, which checks the same condition. Uh, when, when I have an issue, I can simply check uh, the use the, this method to check is, if this is active or is inactive uh, without querying the database again. So, the solution, what is the solution? The solution here is just copy-paste. But it is a problem because whenever we change this query in the repository, we should not forget to change here. So, the, a good solution is the specification pattern. A specification is a name it reusable and combinable class to filter objects based on domain rules. A, a specification typically define it uh, like that as a I specification of T interface, which gets the T, this is entity or some business objects, and returns true if this business object satisfies the condition. We can just extend this interface which is not common uh, in the internet, to add an to expiration method, which converts this filter to an expiration, which makes it use, uh, easier to use in a link queue expiration. We will see the sample. Uh, one improvement can be creating an abstract-based class that implements this interface, but leaves the to expiration implementation to the uh, derived class. So this base class makes it easier to create, create specifications. You can find such code base on internet, so it's not important to understand it all. But whenever we want to create a specification, now we can inherit from the specification of issue uh, class. So to expression method, just I copy it uh, from the repository, and you know this expression, and it just returns this expression. So whenever I want to uh, use this expression, first I create, uh, I change it get is inactive issues method, name it to get issues. That time it gets a specification uh, object. So uh, now I don't have to create multiple uh, get issues methods like get issues of a user, get issues in a milestone. I can just reuse the get issues method with different specification objects. I implemented. Uh, the repository like that, I just reuse it the same DB context that issues, but in this time, I just use it to, to expiration method to convert the specification to expression which works in the var method as a parameter. So whenever I want to get inactive issues from the repository, I just use the get issues method with creating a new is in a, uh, new inactive issue specification object. That is very easy, simple, and elegant. Uh, now, whenever I want to reuse the same expression, I can, I can just instantiate a new inactive issue specification object. For example, for the issue entities is inactive method. I can just create a new specification and call it is satisfied by method for this object. So I can reuse the same logic everywhere in my application by defining in a single point. Combining specifications is also possible. Assume that we have another specification that checks if an issue is assigned to a milestone. 
in this case, the issue milestone specification is a parametric specification which gets a milestone ID and store in the in a private field, then it reuses this milestone ID in the two expression method. Now, if I want to get inactive issues in a milestone, then I create a new inactive issue specification, uh, call and and extension method with new issue milestone specification, and then I reuse. Uh, then I use this combined specification in the repository method as a parameter. So I can now define multiple uh, reusable filters and can combine them to create a single filter and reuse the same repository method again. The magic here, the end method. And I cannot show the end method code. You can just find on the internet because it uses some link queue magic, uh, link queue expressions magic to make it possible. But it's a standard code. Let's come to the domain services. Domain service implements domain logic that depends on services and repositories and pr uh, probably needs to work with multiple entity types. It works with domain objects, not DTOs. For example, let's uh, convert this business role to a domain service. I am making, uh, I am removing the external service dependency of the issue from the assignment, sorry, assigned to method, made it, made it private, and the assigned to method from, uh, I changed it from public to internal. That makes it possible to only call this method from the domain layer. And I have now created an issue manager, which is a typical domain service which gets an issue and user and makes some conditional checking, just like we have seen before, and throws an exception if there is a problem in the business condition, and calls the issue that assigned to method to finalize the uh, business logic. The problem here is this assigned to method, yes, is not usable from outside of domain layer, but in the domain layer, any programmer can assign uh, an issue to a user without checking that. Yeah, this is reasonable because domain uh, programmers know the domain and know the issue manager and will use this method. We can trust them. Uh, but it's up to you. If you move this to uh, the entity, you ensure the business rule, but it makes your entity depending on external services. Let's come to the application services. Application service imp implement uh, use case of the application, generally defined as application logic. It doesn't implement core domain logic of your system. An application service gets and returns data transfer objects, not entities. Uh, it uses domain services, entities, repositories, and other domain objects to perform the use case. They, it, may, it coordinates them to perform the use case. Let's see a typical application service. It injects domain services and repositories, gets the, a data transfer object, which is a serializable object, because uh, yeah, we don't have to make this, but it's, it should be serializable by uh, its nature, because uh, generally third-party uh, systems send JSON objects that's converted to object, so it should be serializable. It uh, then gets aggregates that will be a part of the use case from the repository, then uses domain service to perform the domain logic, and finally updates the change it, change it aggregate in the repository, in the database. So we should always update the entity explicitly. We cannot assign that entity framework uses change tracking, because uh, our system should be ORM independent. There are some best practices and conventions for DTOs. Some common principles, it should be serializable, so it should have a parameterless constructor. It should not contain any business logic. This is an important rule. It never inherits from entities, never reference to entities. Entities 
are our secrets in the domain and application layers. It should not be exposed to the presentation layer. I want to split input and output DTO best practices because they uh, have some slight differences. Uh, I suggest to define the only properties needed for the use case. So this is uh, this maybe uh, seems simple. You may think why I uh, define properties I am not using in the use case, but it occurs when you want to reuse the same input DTO among multiple use cases. So don't reuse the same input DTO for multiple use cases. This is a bad example because, for instance, uh, this application service has create, update, and change username, and they all using the same user DTO. ID is not used in the create, you know, so we, don't, uh, we shouldn't sh share the same DTO for create and update. Password also is not used in update and change username. Creation time definitely should not be sent by the client. It should be calculated in the client side. So a better approach to create specialized uh, input DTOs for each method. That uh, a DTO has the only properties required for the use case. Uh, uh, the input DTO should not implement a validation that requires a business uh, rule. It can use simple data uh, validation annotations if your framework, if your infrastructure supports it. If it is not supported, you should do it in the application service. For the output DTOs, actually it's a bit different. Uh, I suggest to keep DTO count minimum, reuse where, where possible except input details as output details. It can contain more properties than the client needs now. It makes it easy to change your application later when your client requirements change. Especially if your clients are third-party clients, then you, uh, the output detail can contain more properties than it is needed now. Return the, uh, I suggest to return the entity detail from create and update methods because some uh, especially for single page applications may uh, require to refresh the, uh, not refresh the whole page, just add, add the new entity to the table or something like that. Uh, there is an exception here for these rules. If the performance is so critical or if you are working for with mass data, then you can create some specialized uh, minimum the output details. Let's see this sample, get methods uh, just gets an ID and returns user DTO, while we have get username and email and get roles methods. I think these are unnecessary because user DTO already contains username and email, and also it can contain a list of roles. And also get list, create, and update DTO uh, methods are using different kind of uh, data transfer object, which is not also unnecessary. We can define just a user DTO which contains user properties, uh, maybe all user properties except some critical information like password. Uh, and it can have a ROS list, so all of the methods can reuse the same uh, DTO object. This is also easier to handle it in the client side. Uh, when you have entities and uh, data transfer objects, you, uh, it's tedious to create a DTO from entity manually because it may have multiple properties, maybe uh, tens of properties. So we can use some auto object mapping libraries like AutoMapper, but in this case, be careful to enable configuration validation. Configuration validation checks uh, your configuration in the beginning of the application, so it throws an exception if there is a configuration problem. That means, uh, you created your entity, you created your DTO, and the later you change it your uh, and property in the entity, it changed its name, but you forgot to change in the DTO side. The configuration validation throws an exception. In this case, you can just know the problem uh, before the production. Also, as a, a necessary rule and a natural rule, don't map input DTOs to entities, but map entities to output DTOs. Why? Because we cannot actually 
map input details to entities because entity has a constructor which takes parameters. So we should use the entity constructor uh, to create the entity. We can perform additional domain actions if necessary. Assume that we have an assigned user ID, which is optional parameter. Uh, the issue creator may choose to assign the issue on creating it. So uh, we perform uh, additional business rule using issue manager. And then uh, it inserts uh, the issue to the repository and finally returns an issue DTO from the create method. So client can use this uh, returning object in user interface or something like that. Okay, as I said before, DDD is for large-scale applications, large-scale systems, rather than single user interface or single cr simple crude application. So you typically will have multiple applications sharing the same domain. For example, you may have a backend office application which is used by your employees, uh, and it's an Angular application. Uh, there is another application which is public application to the end users, which is implemented using uh, MVC UI. And finally, you may have a mobile application, which suggests to create separate application layers for each application type. And don't share a single application layer, because different applications has different requirements for the application, for the use cases, different service method, different users ca use cases, different DTO property requirements, and so on. But you reuse the same single domain layer to share the core domain logic. So it becomes important uh, to know which logic is domain logic, which logic is application logic. Because if you implement a core domain logic inside the back office application layer, and it will not be reusable in other applications, and you will have some inconsistent data in the database. So domain-driven design, for this reason, splits your business logic into application logic and domain logic. I want to, uh, as, a, as a last uh, slide, I want to show a few examples uh, to understand what, uh, if your logic fits into, into a domain service or application service. Let's see an example. Let's be, begin with a simple example. A uh, developer created an application service which injects a domain service and it delegates everything to this domain service. I have seen many code bases like that. Developers think that I should move everything in the domain service. I have created uh, methods in the domain service for each use case, but this is not true. First of all, don't create domain services to perform simple crude operations. Just use repositories in the application service. Also, there is a problem here. You should never pass DTOs or return DTOs from domain services. It, just, it is a part of the application layer. DTOs should be inside the application layer. So after this sim simple example, let's see a typical uh, domain service, which is organization manager. It's another domain. Uh, let's see the uh, create organization method, which gets a name and creates a new organization. It first checks if there is an organization with the same name and throws an exception in this case. This is definitely a business rule, so it should be implemented in the domain service. That's true. Then it checks for authorization. Authorization is a part of the application layer. It, is, it should not be implemented in the domain layer because different applications will have different authentication requirements. Maybe you have a, a background job system. That's, there is no user in, that, in this case, and there is no meaning of authorization. So and this code will not be reusable in this case. So authorization is an application-dependent logic. Also, it access to the current user. As I said before, a background job has not a current user concept at all. So this is also not reusable in another type of application. It then sends an email. Sending an email also is not a core domain logic because 
in some cases, I may not want to send the email. For my, uh, in some cases, I may want to. So the true implementation, it should be done in the application layer, depending on the uh, use case. Or if it's always sending an email, you can uh, implement in uh, via domain events, which is not a topic covered in this uh, session. Uh, it finally returns the organization. Uh, there is no problem here. Okay, let's see the organization application service. It's an application service. Uh, and it also has the create method, which gets a create organization DTO. Application service method should be a unit of work, transactional, if it contains more than one database operations. So a unit of work attribute would, would be fine here. But if you have such attributes, you will uh, probably have to create some interception logic or action filters to be able to implement this. This is infrastructure stuff, and DDD and me are ignoring it. So, it also checks authorized authorize attribute for a policy that's also to re-implementation. It then uses payment service to charge money from the current user to be able to create organization. If the payment is successful, then it uh, creates, reuses the organization manager to create the organization. It sends an email. It sends an email. Okay, sorry. It sends an email and returns the org organization entity. But this is not true because, as I said before, entities should not be returned from the application services. We should create a data transfer object for that. You should think that why not moving payment logic inside the domain service, inside the organization manager? Because payment is important and should be always done. But it's not like that. Being important is not enough to move some code into domain service. Application services are very important also. So uh, think that we have a backend application where it is not required to uh, charge payment to create uh, an organization. So in this case, payment is actually optional. It's not a part of the core domain logic. Uh, to be a serious DDD programmer, I definitely suggest these three fundamental books. The domain-driven design, implementing domain-driven design, and clean architecture. You can take a screenshot if you have never heard about that. But they are very popular. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, if you have, yeah. If you have questions, I can take now or in the break time. Yes, we have five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you for practical advices. It's really useful when you try to start and don't know what's going on and you just want to make it work. And I have additional questions about uh, domain events. I know that you said it's not part of the presentation, but uh, for example, when you have a relation between two aggregates, uh, in your boiler, boilerplate code, uh, you use uh, some services to do operations which involve two aggregates, let's say issue and the user. And uh, am I right that the other alternative is to use domain events? Uh, or? Yes. Uh... Actually, domain events is used for site domain logic, not for the core domain logic. Uh, and it's also used to decouple some business operations. Especially, it is useful if you have multiple uh, bounded contexts. I didn't mention about bounded context because this is not a theoretical talk. This is practical talk. If you have multiple uh, bounded contexts and you don't want to couple contexts, you can use a local event pass or a distributed event pass using some RabbitMQ or Kafka to uh, publish and consume events. Yes, it's also useful in this case. Uh, and in your boilerplate code, uh, you don't use it? Or do, do you have it, like in, in your libraries? Uh, for the ASP.NET boilerplate, yeah. it's integrated to, uh, for the next generation of ASP.NET boilerplate, which is released in the next uh, oh. In the last <laughs> week, it supports RabbitMQ integration with an uh, distributed event bus service. So it supports. 
And uh, like the last question, uh, do you think uh, it's worth uh, making it more complex with domain events or it's better to avoid it somehow? Like maybe in your projects, do you use it? Uh, yeah, if you're uh, talking about CQRS or even sourcing, or uh, just dom domain events and uh, yeah, secure S event sourcing. Can yeah. you mix it? Like, yeah. is it worth it? Yeah, I am using dom uh, secure S in simple projects, but I have not a good experience on it. So it's completely a different talk. Uh, actually, it's it's a different topic uh, for a different session. Maybe uh, is there any secure S talk in this event? Uh, yes, uh, we had a, yeah. a talk yesterday. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah. Then you you already seen it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, and thank you, you can thank also you take the, the presentation from here. Sorry. Sorry. So thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, I have one question. Uh, you were mentioning about the case when uh, aggregate has a list of some related entities and this list is very big so it's not efficient to load all this list. So what is your recommendation how to work in this case? If, if for, I want for, to add... I don't understand. For the primary case? No, no. Uh, I can open it. the... So, um, for example, we have an aggregate and uh, this aggregate has a list of some related entities. Yes. And sometimes this list can be very big and it's not efficient to load all this list with aggregate. Yes. So what so is your recommendation? Keep it small. <laughs> 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 yeah, it should be small. Yes, it should not be so big. And uh, it typically uh, a collection of an aggregate uh, should not contain more than 15 elements inside it. If it has more than 15 elements, like here, roles have a user's collection. Uh, as I said, role may have thousands of users assigned to it. So you should not introduce uh, a user's collection inside the role. It should be simple. And also, there is another problem which I didn't say. Uh, if you design it your uh, domain like that, whenever you uh, assign a user to a role, you should change both aggregates because for, for, uh, for example, think in a NoSQL database like MongoDB, it will be serialized and also this will be serialized. So the same information will be stored twice. So uh, if you add a user in this collection, you should also add a role to this collection together. Otherwise, you will have inconsistent data in the database. So this is another problem. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Uh, thank you again for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I have one small question. In your, um, in your layered application, you have two layers, application and domain. Where do you store uh, the entities? Where is the place to persist the entities. Entities are, yes, let me show this. Entities is defined in the domain project. Let's see the uh, Visual Studio solution. I didn't find it. No, I mean, uh, where is the place when you yes. call a repository save? Uh, you, are you asking where is uh, the domain entities located? Uh, it's no. here. No, when you, uh, for example, create a user, yeah. after you want to save it, where do you uh, make the call to repository to save the user? Yes, in the application layer. Okay, thank you. Yes. Good. So, this should be all, right? If you thank want you to, again. If you uh, want to... I will be in the... Yeah, you can talk me in the break time. Yeah, you can continue the discussion, and that should be all. Please thank our... Speaker.